introduction. Good Hi. evening to everyone. It's all good. It's really an honor to share time with everyone tonight and to learn alongside all of you. I'm really touched that you took some time out of your evening to join me today. And I hope we'll be able to have some good conversation after this. So I wanted to begin with sharing a little bit about myself and highlight the things that have been keeping me awake at night for many years. I recall being storied as a problem throughout my K-12 schooling experiences. My location as a Pakistani Canadian Muslim woman who was born and raised in Edmonton, Alberta, and a child of immigrants who are originally from Pakistan could not be held together in a confluence of ways. As I remember the reduction of my being to neatly packaged categories of representation, I feel rawness and resentment re-entering my body. My body has kept the score. Gazing backward, I also recall the Crusades incident, as I like to call it. Mrs. B, my grade five teacher, shared a Coles Notes version of the Crusades during our social studies lesson. In her view, Islam and Muslims were a threat to Christianity. Muslims were uncivilized and barbaric and were interfering with progress. Soon after, a classmate proclaimed that I was bad because I was Muslim. Mrs. B heard this and did not utter a word. As I dwell in Mrs. B's silence, I am reminded of the rising Islamophobia in the wake of September 11, 2001. I vividly remember Muslim friends, sitting, Muslim friends and I sitting with great fear and anxiety as we watched the news in our math class together. We hoped and prayed that Muslims were not behind this act and knew what was to come if our fears were to be actualized. The days following 9-11 were full of sadness and disillusionment. The death of innocent individuals coupled with the demonizing of over a billion Muslims was exacerbated by the fact that no teacher in my high school took the time to address 9-11. Shifting treatment from friends and peers was the most painful of all at this time. It was as if they had forgotten our relationship. These happenings brought forth periods of self-silencing and great imbalance for me. This imbalance unsurprisingly impacted my relationships with others. While I desperately was seeking to connect with Islam's message of holism in my daily life and living, particularly on schooling and other institutional landscapes, I found myself continuously silencing this aspect of who I was. In light of these happenings and continued experiences of Islamophobia, I initially took it upon myself, rather naively so, to become an ambassador for Islam. Glimpses of freedom and ease filled my body as I started to learn from critical theory during the final year of my B.Ed. Critical theory gave me a language, so to speak, to identify the extent to which I had been assimilating myself on schooling landscapes and to speak to my experiences of exclusion. Being able to learn and think with critical theory has been integral to opening up what has been keeping me awake at night for many years. For these reasons, my master's thesis explored the extent to which Islamophobia was reinforced in Alberta secondary schooling contexts through an over-reliance on social stocks of knowledge and a propensity to shy away from difficult knowledge. I did not initially realize what I was overlooking by relying on critical theory alone to address my experiences of Islamophobia. My assumptions that I could only contribute from my head and respond to Islamophobia via epistemic insertions missed how I was trying to recover Islam's message of holism. These realizations continue to shift while learning alongside recent newcomer high school students and a high population of First Nations Métis and Inuit students at an urban high school in Alberta. As a senior high social studies, English language arts, Canadian studies and ESL teacher, I was excited for the opportunities to enact critical theory 
and anti-racist pedagogy alongside my students. My initial excitement turned to confusion as I could not understand why students were not connecting with anti-racism given their lived experiences in the ways that the research had highlighted and in the ways that I assumed that they would. During the first year and a half of my doctoral studies, I found myself further disconnected from anti-racist discourse as I gradually started reconnecting with myself and the generative energy that flows from global wisdom traditions. Connecting with sacred ecological insights or the entities that make life possible, such as the sun, water, and wind, deeply inspired my doctoral research and continues to guide my current research program. I was blessed to learn from these wisdoms alongside Elder Bob Cardinal from Enoch Cree Nation in Alberta, Dr. Dwayne Donald, peers and friends during a holistics approaches to learning course. We learned from Cree sensibilities, participated in ceremony, and were guided through activities that helped us to reconnect with ourselves and nature. Learning through story, songs, and ceremonies brought forth feelings of peace, balance, and hope that I didn't realize were possible. Elder Bob's humility, patience, and loving guidance, along with his highly subjective teaching style, allowed me to be truly seen for the first time in my life. As I share these insights, I remember Elder Bob's guidance to take our time, not to rush process and learning. Learning in this way, facing my ecological amnesia and seeking guidance from the Four Directions teachings helped me to realize what I had been forsaking along the way and forsaking in my own life. I also realized that I was not living Islam's teachings of balancing Zahir and Bathin or the material and spiritual and Ashraf al mukhlukah or caring for our more than human relatives in the ways that I could have. These experiences intersected with spending two years as an interested community member and educator, learning with and alongside former Aboriginal Studies 30 students. Aboriginal Studies 30 is a provincially mandated course in Alberta that is also offered at the 10 and 20 level. The course is grounded in sacred ecological wisdom philosophies, Indigenous worldviews, particular to an Albertan land-based context, and seeks to open up Canada's ongoing history of colonialism and ontological violence towards Indigenous peoples. The course, as it was offered at the urban high school I taught at, did so in a wisdom-informed way that did not deny or overlook spirit. Students were given the opportunity to reconnect with themselves, learn from traditional knowledges, as inspired by Cree teachings in particular, partake in ceremony, attend many field trips, land-based learning opportunities, and learn from the lived experiences of local Indigenous community members. These classes were comprised of third generation Canadians, recent newcomers, and Indigenous students. During my time with students in this class, I was struck by their dedication to challenging grand narratives of Canadian history and dwelling with difference in ways that were not beholden to notions of Canadian citizenship or perspectival renderings of difference. It was during this time that I was also exposed to notions of treaty that were not limited to legalistic renderings alone. I was not aware of the sacred ecological foundations of treaty and how treaty was made in promise with creator and is inviable. These insights resonated with me deeply and I finally realized that I was in fact a treaty person who had been invited into relationship. The confluence of reconnecting with sacred ecological insights, learning from Elder Bob and former Aboriginal studies students evoked a new ethic that I could no longer ignore. For these reasons, my doctoral research explored the curricular and pedagogical significance of holism in deepening understandings of difference. 
I attended to this work alongside four former Aboriginal Studies students, Alyssa, Rose, Levi, and Chantel, all of which are from different backgrounds, and we enacted the decolonizing process of metissage. Metissage is a theory and textual practice that supports the recovery of relationships in response to prevailing colonial logics that continue to deny the difference. Metissage beckons the reclamation of lived experiences, memories, histories, land-based knowledges, creation stories, and holistic philosophies that are often overlooked, assimilated, or regarded as conflictual. For these reasons, metissage provokes relationships where they're usually not found, and it highlights the simultaneous presence of differences and similarities. The mixing of differences and similarities is regarded as a creative and transformative act that helps to reposition subjectivity as a key source of guidance that can help to support balance, wellness, and healing. The work that I did alongside Alyssa, Rose, Levi, and Chantel involved four different activities that helped us to revisit experiences in Aboriginal studies. We also participated in group and individual conversations. I realized that it was necessary to attend to embodied knowledges and wisdom guided sacred ecological philosophies to bring to life what had been lost. Aboriginal Studies 30 was the best example of a curricular and pedagogical context that brought to life what was missing in my own my own education, which was connections to the mental, emotional, spiritual, and physical dimensions. While I am not an Indigenous person and have been learning from Cree and Blackfoot philosophies consistently for the last eight years and continue to work towards allyship with Indigenous communities in Alberta and now in Manitoba, I realized that it was important to open up that which I had learned from in the hopes that others could learn from it too. For these reasons, my work drew upon Sufi wisdoms, giving my upbringing in Islam and my commitment to reclaiming Islam's Quranic messages encased in Rumi's poetry and juxtaposing these teachings with Cree philosophies as an ethical act, which was inspired by Cree sensibility. I understand treaty informed connections and relationships respect the rights, values, and pathways that we take in life. Mutuality and reciprocity undergird treaty relationship. For these reasons, I conceptualize learning from Cree sensibilities as absolutely essential to honoring my treaty relationship. And learning over time that I am a treaty person. I desire to honor the traditions of the people in whose traditional territory I reside. I believe that a failure to live my treaty relationship is irresponsible because I will be complicit in dishonoring creator's law, which will negate my responsibility to care for creation and strengthen balance. The research revealed the three key holistic themes, including balance, healing, and kinship. The following question, how does kinship guide deepened understandings of connectivity, addresses Rose, Levi, and Chantel's experiences of reconnecting with sacred ecology while they were students in Aboriginal Studies 30. Rose shared, it is such an honor to receive a bundle. It is the greatest gift that an Aboriginal person can give. It is an experience that no one can take from you. You have it for life. I feel so proud that she picked me. I cried when Jody gave it to me. I can't explain why it means so much to me. It makes me more compassionate. It's not just about me. It's a European perspective, a Spanish perspective, an Aboriginal perspective. I see it as all perspectives going together. When I experience like this, it makes me more honest with myself. It is different from just reading about it. So for those of you who might be unfamiliar with what bundles are, 
Bundles play a key role in maintaining the health and well being for many Indigenous peoples. Physical bundles refer to a collection of sacred items that can include medicines and eagle feathers at time. And they are often carried by Indigenous peoples attending ceremony. From different interpretations, the idea is that when a child is born, they come into a, the world with a spiritual bundle, which holds all the gifts that the creator gave to them. The physical and spiritual bundle are then seen as being essential to supporting ba balance and wellness in daily life and living. So drawing upon Rose's insights here, her powerful words reminded me of the important gifts of reconnecting with our more than human relatives, our relations, and how for her, the gift of the bundle seemed to evoke something that she was also perhaps missing and seeking to reconnect with. She also seemed to internalize these teachings in ways that convoked her to think about connectivity in ways and learning from different ways of knowing and being that transcended relying on multiple perspectives. So for her, this wasn't just about the mere insertion of knowledge, but this pointed to her remembering her relations deeply and seeing how she was implicated in supporting these relationships in her daily life and living. Her insights point to the urgency and possibility to attend to a curriculum of embodiment on curricular and pedagogical sites as a way to unlearn colonialism and recover relationships. Levi shared, water makes up everyone's body. And like people say, the water that people bathed in in the 1700s is the water that we could be drinking today. It just shows that everything is truly a cycle and is connected. I don't think that our differences are a hindrance to that at all. I think that we should celebrate differences and similarities because everything is about balance. Levi reflected on the teaching that all bodies are made of water, people bathe in water and also drink water. His learnings from the sacred gift of water help him to articulate an understanding of connectivity that holds our relations together. Levi further explained that the different ways in which water supports life and living conveys the understanding that everything is truly a life cycle. Drawing upon inspiration from holistic guided sacred ecological insights, Levi understands the simultaneous presence of similarities and differences as another opportunity to instill balance. It is Levi's kinship with other life-giving entities that invites inner reflection and a deepened sense of connectivity. Chantal articulated, we are not perfect beings. We are filled with error and faults and mistakes. And that's how we learn. And if we were surrounded by a world that is perfect and looked identical and the same, and every tree grew at the same place, what would we learn from? We would destroy ourselves. The land is different in every place. Chantel shared the dangers that would arise if we were surrounded by a world that is perfect and looked identical and the same. She pondered if every tree grew at the same place, what would we learn from them? She indicates that the presence of sameness would inevitably lead to the destruction of ourselves. Her dwelling in these insights and alongside her kinship relational networks reminds her that the land is different in every place and that there is a deeper reason for this. Chantal's holistic readings of connectivity also reposition and help us to explore the fact that differences that arise through error and faults can have the potential to be transformative and support openness. Former Aboriginal Studies students' insights have many foundational insights to offer to the future of curriculum and pedagogy. Firstly, reinterpreting my subjective experiences of holism in relationship to Cree philosophies brings forth a manifestation of holism that does not erase spirit and fears of secular institutional impositions. 
Secondly, this work recovers how Islam is also a holistic tradition that can inspire living wisely and well by dwelling in Rumi's poetry. Thirdly, this work proposes a metasage through dialogue between Cree and Sufi sensibilities that tries to aesthetically represent what is left out on pedagogical sites when holism is abandoned. Lastly, this work invites readers to take seriously the curricular and pedagogical significance of healing and how holistic insights in this regard can promote wellness and relationships that inspire us to acknowledge and seek guidance from the transformative beauty of our relationships. Thank you so much, Sarah. Clapping from over here. Yeah, thank you. I wonder if we could move into a time of questions now. I've, I've got some, but I'm going to just kind of sit back and um, if anyone has questions for Zara, just feel free to unmute yourself and ask directly, or if you'd rather, you can put them in the chat or I could read them to her. So go ahead. I'll maybe ask you a question, Zara, while people are maybe thinking of theirs and formulating some thoughts. Um, I really like the phrase that you used of ecological amnesia. And I wonder if you would say that we also have spiritual amnesia. Yeah, that's a really great insight. I want to give a nod to my life mentor here, <laughs> Dwayne Donald, not to embarrass him. But that's definitely a phrase that I learned from him um, in my years of working with him. And so when I think about ecological amnesia, I think about both of those aspects here deeply connected with that spiritual amnesia as well. And I know that this is often something that's not popular to talk about. It's something for me personally, as you know, that has evoked a lot of anxiety <laughs> and pressure for me over the years to address because it hasn't been popular to talk about spirituality, uh, the role of faith and holistic philosophies on different institutional landscapes, particularly in schools, in terms of their supposed positioning as being entirely secular. So I think in terms of our relationships and thinking about the structuring of our society, the fact that our schools and the writing of curriculum are predominantly guided by neoliberal philosophies, there has definitely been a forgetting of other ways to live. And this ecological amnesia has, of course, been accelerated by those philosophies as well, and also has accelerated the fact that spirituality is often seen as not welcome. I think in those spaces, which can cause a lot of harm to many young people, I would say other educators, school leaders, community members, so on and so forth. Yeah, I feel like in the times that we're in, facing climate crisis, facing this pandemic, all of the kind of turmoil of the world around us, this kind of teaching is, is so needed. And so thank you so much for speaking with bravery and boldness in a space that is sometimes difficult to, to speak about this topic in. So I really admire you for that. And thank you for sharing. Thank you, Michelle. Does anyone else have any questions? Yeah, Joe, go ahead. Hi, good evening. That was wonderful, Zara. Thank you for, for sharing that. I, I was circling back to, to something you said early on in the presentation about your experience when you first started teaching and how it shocked you at first, how students didn't seem receptive to ideas that were exciting you mm -hmm. as, as a new scholar and as a new teacher. So I always look, look back on my career and that if I, if I had known then what I know now kind of ideas. So if you were to return to a classroom space, what, what would have changed in your approach or? Oh, that's such an awesome question, Joe. Thank you. And thanks for joining us. 
Oh, if I could go back in time, um, I would like to tell myself to get out of my own way. That's something that I like to continue to tell myself. I know some people here know this about me already because I've talked to them about this, but also being, of course, much less presumptuous and making the assumption that different frameworks of learning, of relating, um, that speak to recovering relationship, if they're put into practice in a way that is used as a blueprint model, that that actually can be really dehumanizing and defeats the purpose and makes us, I feel, it exacerbates the things that we're seeking not to do. So that's something that I try to think about. And even with this work, though it's so close to my heart, I have to remember that, of course, I'm not suggesting that connecting with holistic philosophies is the only way that healing could happen. And it would be absolutely absurd if I was suggesting that, but I would think of having more of a grain of salt and taking my time to be careful and more mindful of honoring relationship in that sense. I have a question. Go ahead, Duane. And then after you, I see Almond has her hand up also, but please go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, Dr. Kasamali, you, uh, you used a phrase that uh, I don't think I'd heard before, and I, I can't actually remember how you said it, but it was something about you're like a promoter of Islam or a, an ambassador. How, how do you put it? An ambassador of Islam. Yeah. Okay. That, that, that gave me a pretty good chuckle. I like that. I can relate to that. So, my question is like, based on how you understand things now, how were you set up? to be that way? Well, that's a great question. And I'm happy that you asked it, Dr. Donald. <laughs> uh, I would think that going back to my K-12 experiences, um, thinking through a lot of my undergrad experiences, a lot of the ways in which we have been guided came from the positionality of you have to be able to share from this. And using this is the only way that you can quote unquote convince people. And I think for me, a lot of this was a manifestation, of course, of colonialism and that prevalence of colonial logics in our education systems and other institutional spaces. And that connects to the comment that I made earlier that I hadn't really realized how much I was assimilating myself and what I was forgetting along the way of doing this work. And I started to feel very out of balance. I used to get sick really often. I was a person who was on social media, very often posting things and getting into friendly conversations with people who would respond back. And that was starting to take a toll on me when I would see any news stories that were related to dehumanizing Muslims in different parts of the world, I would have a really hard time dealing with it. So I think being guided in a way to only rely upon intellectual insertions actually created a lot of imbalance for me. And I didn't realize at the time that when I was coming from this purview of anti-racism and Islamophobia alone, that I found myself caught in the trap of just wanting to convince people and wanting people to validate my experiences so badly. But again, that wasn't, that wasn't really well supporting the recovery of relationship with myself and others. It was hurting my soul in deep ways. But I would say when I was able to be guided in another way, um, that was really helpful for me to remember about the heart work. And as Elder Bob Cardinal will say, the longest distance that you ever have to travel is between your head and your heart. And for me, that continues to be the hardest work of my life in terms of becoming fully human in that sense. Thank you. Can you You're see welcome. me? I can see you, yes. Okay, uh, I, I can't figure out how, how things are working here. But anyway, I'm glad you can see me. So um, I, I guess I'm just hoping that that you continue to work with that idea of an ambassador, because I, I mean, I was just re sort of reflecting on, you know, based on what you said, and some other things that, uh, you know, in a certain sense, if you, if if you fully accept as true the, the 
the the story of immigration in relation to the Canadian nation and nationality and your subjectivity and your, your you know family subjectivity within that then the ambassador role makes a lot of sense right it's it's like the the uh, the the success model of of what that wants you to do in terms of a human being right to sort of be that multicultural ambassador and i was just thinking that um eve tuck has a pretty interesting paper maybe you've seen i think it's called breaking up with the lose mm -hmm. and uh, maybe maybe you can break up with multiculturalism or uh you know i i just think that uh that that expression of ambassador really cuts to the chase on on the trap that uh that you were in that you really tried to shake off so thanks Thanks for that, Dwayne. Really helpful. Go ahead. I feel, yeah, I feel so um, pressured having <laughs> come after Dwayne, who's also influenced my work a lot. So Zara, thank you for the profoundly personal presentation. I feel so reflected in everything that you shared, because as you know, I also come from a culture where other is not other, according to Levinas. For us, other is similar. It's no different. So we have a word called kapwa, which means you and me together. It's a Oh, Amand, I think you're oh, from. No. I think Almond was joining all the way from the Philippines. So I'm messaging her. Oh, maybe. Oh, all right. Oh, you're back. Almond, you froze for just a couple of minutes. Do you want to just go back a okay. little bit to what Where you were saying? Where did I stop? I'm sorry, Michelle. That's that's okay. I think um you had just said that you have a word kapwa or uh, sorry if yeah, that's okay. Not. Yes, okay, that's where you left off. Okay, the word Kapwa is actually central to our culture. So it's an identity that is fused with other. So it's not Levinas, other as forever other, but other as similar. So I liked how you ju juxtaposed similarity and difference, especially where you are now in Canada. So I wanted to ask how your work has transformed your teaching. So if you were to go back to Mrs. B, if you were Mrs. B, how would you have handled that situation with little Zara? And how, how does the work that you do as an ambassador of Islam and your understanding about similarity and difference change the way you practice teaching? Oh, I just love that question. Could write a paper and do so many things with that question. I think I will address the little Zara comment first. I think with Mrs. B, um, I would have had more of the courage to tell her, actually, you're completely telling one side of this story. It's definitely a grand narrativized approach. Do you realize that there are people from different ways of knowing and being and positionalities? Of course, I wouldn't be using that language in grade five, but you're catching my drift here that are in your class and that maybe you're not realizing that you're doing this intentionally, but it's causing a lot of hurt and a lot of damage to my inner being. Just having that frank conversation about the emotionality of everything. Because I think about for me, as I share this in schools, that there was never really a place for me to connect with that emotionality alongside my teachers and other peers as well. And I think about the ramifications of that today, especially considering our ongoing time during this pandemic and then what is taken for granted and not uncovered by avoiding having those conversations that aren't just about what's up in here. And to address Amand, your second awesome question, I think in terms of my teaching, I have become a lot more comfortable from speaking from the place of lived experiences, of honoring process, of in a metissage kind of way, honoring the fact that my lived realities, my subjective truths, 
my, you know, spiritual understandings, the way that I relate and my embodied knowledges are just as important and worthy as any other forms of knowledge and guidance in that in my teaching, I really try to highlight that recovery, I would say quite a bit in classes. And I know that I can annoy a lot of students um, for quite a while initially because they're not necessarily used to that sort of thing. And they're wondering what I'm trying to do to them and putting them in a position where they have to get a bit uncomfortable and not be given information in a way that's very, I would say linearly presented or just limited to something that they can get in terms of a textbook. So I would say that has changed quite a bit in being able to have conversations about spirit and wisdom and holism, which used to make me very nervous uh, for a, a lot of my life. Thank you. I'm looking forward to reading more of the things that you have in store for us. Thank you, Amand, and for the question. I'd like to ask a question. Yes, please. Thank you for that presentation. Very interesting. So I guess I'm wondering uh, with the approach that Zara you take with the students currently or have been practicing for a while, I suppose, do you find a transformation that you see in some students, let's say from the beginning of the term to I guess the end of the term and how they receive your approach? Um, I guess that's part A and part B, it'd be so interesting, maybe this is just a, like a hypothetical thing, but it'd be so interesting to see, um, you know, if some of the students who you teach do take the approach and adjust how they teach down the road when they're actually in classrooms educating children, but I don't know, um, it'd be an interesting research study, I think, for part B, but anyway. I love that, Olya. Thanks for that awesome question. Uh, to address your first question, I'm going to piggyback to some of my experiences with Aboriginal Studies 30, because being alongside those students in different sections and at the school was sort of my first experience of hearing students saying that a course at the high school level was life changing for them. And that made me wonder what it was about that context that was supporting that life changing sort of energy amongst these young people. And that, as I shared earlier, I got to understand that it was really guided by the holism of the course and the way that the course was honored with the teachers and the students and the community and so on and so forth. I would say for me, what I've noticed with a lot of students in terms of transformation um, is the ways in which they've become more comfortable and being able to recover their inner knowledges or body knowledges and seeing that as something that is important, that it's something that they don't have to push down um, to be a part of society. Another aspect is the increase in vulnerability and openness in sharing emotions, things that make people cry in a very open way. And it's been my experience in a lot of classes where students will eventually, they'll become comfortable and share things and they'll cry. And I know that can be seen as daunting in a lot of circumstances, but it's definitely very generative and creative with that presence. I've also had students come to me at the end of courses saying that, you know, I appreciate that you were able to connect with holistic traditions because you reminded me of things that I used to practice before and that I haven't been doing so much and that I need. And for other students, it's happened that, you know, I've actually not been guided in that way or raised in that way. And I want to learn more. There's something there that I'm curious about in terms of that supporting my well-being and balance amongst myself and others. Uh, with regards to your second question, Olia, I, I think that would be a wonderful teaching study. So I'm going to have to reference you in that idea when I put in a grant proposal. <laughs> For sure, but that's something that with some former students who have kept in touch, they have talked about honoring those sensibilities and wanting to bring forth that balance in their own classrooms as best as they can. 
to support the well being of their students and themselves and whoever else is coming alongside for sure. I have one more question for you, Zara. So I think you referenced Elder Bob Cardinal, is that correct? He yes. said something about how we need to take time and slow down. And so if you're holding that teaching and then thinking about your current system where you're a new professor in this sort of tenure track, go, go, I know your teaching load and your first year. And so how do you maintain that teaching in your life while being in the system that you're in? And maybe you don't know that yet. I don't know, but I would like to know oh, for myself as well. I'm in the same system. So I would love to hear your thoughts on that topic. Thank you for that. You've actually reminded me of another comment um, that connects back to Amon's question earlier that in terms of changing my teaching, I did become comfortable slowing down. And I know in K-12 classrooms, there's so much pressure to cover curriculum, to cover content, to get students ready for standardized exams, and a lot of pressure at the post-secondary level to be able to get through things in a certain way. And I found myself telling students in this class, you're going to find that we might carry things over pretty often. We might not go with what was planned, and that's okay and that we're gonna take our time to dwell in the moment. And of course, some people really appreciate that initially and others it's very uncomfortable to not have some of that control and certainty. But just going to your question, you know, what transitioning into this position, of course, we, you know, it's been a lot of work and a lot of different things going on. But for me, I really try throughout the day to make that time for remembrance in a spiritual way to spend time outside. Um, I do take the time to, like I've been talking about, I think I share this at another meeting, to make sure that I'm getting exercise and having that time away from a screen, having connections with loved ones and prayer is really important to me even in those smaller moments within like a class, let's say, or a meeting to have that time. And that can, of course, for different people, doesn't have to be prayer in a very particular kind of way, but that can look really different for different people. And making sure um, that I have limits every night <laughs> in terms of when I'm gonna stop looking at email or when I'm gonna stop reading an article or something like that. I learned from my wise mentor, no theory after nine o'clock, which is, which is a rule that I actually do keep. So, cause I know that I can get all caught up in my head and get into all these different directions. Um, but that's something that I do to ground myself. And I love reading Rumi's poetry because it really helps to ground me and remember, reminds me of my connections to something deeper. Thank you so much. There's just a couple comments in the chat. Almond had written, focusing on understanding, not coverage. That's the most important thing. I think that's in relation to your comment just now. And Ginny wrote, Zara, thank you for your thoughtful talk. You share much of the complexities involved in shifting away from the impositions perpetuated by master narratives. You indicated that you have embodied Rumi's teachings as well. And I wonder if you could speak a bit about that. Absolutely, thank you. That's a really awesome question, Ginny. I think about if I go back to Rumi's poetry, he talks again about things that might not be so popular <laughs> in certain spaces, but at the same time, somehow he's one of the most popular poets in North America. And people like to share his poetry on Instagram and Facebook. So go figure with that. But to, to address the point here, so Rumi likes to talk a lot about what connects all life forms and what is important to hold on to. And he talks about the fact that, you know, depending on whatever your beliefs are, that he feels that we're all connected by a spirit that unites us all. And in his teachings in which he draws upon Quranic philosophies as well, he talks about connections also to sacred ecology that binds us all. And in terms of that sort of embodiment, 
and thinking about also his teaching towards addressing and really addressing suffering and hardships head on. I take a lot of inspiration in that way because he always he always tends to say and I'm not translating this in the best way, but he's basically saying, don't be a fool. Don't go and run away from the problem because it's going to come back and bite you somewhere where it's really going to hurt. So why not attend to it in the moment and have faith and realize that this is something that's going to nurture you and grow you and move you forward. So I feel in dwelling in those teachings and thinking about that role of what, that understanding of what connects us and what gives life in that sense, it does flow into the ways in which I teach and definitely come into relationship where I try as best as I can to honor those philosophies, to make them known from the place that they come from and to have honest conversations, I would say with students about that in that regard and, you know, talk about that we all have our own creation stories and things that guide us in our own life that are very worthy and, you know, have much say, even if we don't realize they're guiding us directly. Thank you. Joe, did you have a question? No? Oh, okay. I saw you turned on your camera, so I wanted to check. Thank you. I'll leave it open for a couple more minutes if there are any other questions from anyone. If not, I'd just like to say a huge thank you again to you, Dr. Kasamali, for being here with us this evening. I think we can tell from the chat and from the conversations that this was a wonderful teaching and a wonderful evening for us to learn from you. And so thank you so much for being here and for sharing with us this evening. Thank you so much, Dr. Lam, for the invitation and for all of you for joining me tonight and your wonderful conversations and questions. I've definitely learned a lot and we'll have some things that I'm going to be thinking about and percolating with tonight. <laughs> Thank you. You have an hour though, you have to stop at nine o'clock. <laughs> yes. <Joe. laughs> yeah, no theory after nine was that. I'm gonna keep that, I think. Yes, I love that. All right. Thanks, Sarah. All right. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. You're Thank welcome. You. Thanks, Mateo. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Have a good night. Amand, Kate, Ginny. Good night.